gibi gelsin. All right, we have some people joining us. We'll just give it a minute while we wait for people to come on. We're just waiting a minute as people are joining us and getting on their Zoom. We're excited to be here this afternoon. Um, I'm Rainy Bench. I'm the um, host for this afternoon's Tobacco Chat. This is season four, episode 14 of our ongoing series uh, related to um, articles that have been printed in Chibaco or talking with authors, historians, and other people who are working with island history to dig in a little bit and learn some more. So we're excited to have you with us this afternoon. Chibaco Chats use a web, uses a webinar format, so please use the chat feature or the question and answer feature for sending comments or questions. You can do so throughout the, um, the discussion this afternoon, but you're, uh, we'll probably answer most of them toward the end. I'll also give you a prompt at the end, um, letting you know that now is a great time to put any questions that you might have in the chat or the question and answer feature at the bottom of your screen. So um, we will record this session and Chibaco chats are available through our website and through our YouTube, YouTube channel, usually about one week after airing. Today, we're speaking with Jesse Bruchette, the author of Plaster and Herring, The Lives of Captain William Heath and Captain David King on Mount Desert Island. Jesse has been kind enough to join us very late in her evening from Reading, UK, where they are a recent graduate from the University of York with a degree in historical archeology. span Jesse spent their fall here in 2022 volunteering with the Southwest Harbor Historical Society, where they came across an interesting series of documents in the archive, inspiring them to write the article in this maritime edition of Chibaco. So welcome, Jesse. Thank you. So um, tell us a little bit about your work when you were here on, the, on Mount Desert Island. Um, where were you volunteering and what were you doing? So, as you said, fall 2022, or autumn, as I would call it. <laughs> um, so I found myself on Mount Desert Island uh, visiting my partner. I was looking at being there for about four weeks and had four weeks of time to fill. So I thought, as an archaeologist and history nerd, I like to approach a place and figure out what's going on there historically, especially if I haven't been there before. Never been to Maine even, so it was an entirely new place. Um, I reached out to Southwest Harbour Historical Society and they got back to me really quickly, which was nice. Um, I just said, Look, I'm in the area, I'd like to help out if I can. So we arranged a meeting, I, um, I turned up and we had a rifle through there the small collection that they've got. Um, they were in the process of digitizing the documents, um, working on also just accessioning everything that they had been that had been donated to them. And we found this copper box of documents that um they're all 19th century and they pertained to Captain William Heath and Captain David King. And we did they didn't they didn't really know what the documents were about they hadn't read through them they'd just been given them so it was it became my job to essentially work through every single document catalog them um i also transcribed quite a lot and scanned the ones that i couldn't transcribe um and put them into chronological order and as i put them into chronological order it actually turned out that what we had was essentially the overview of their entire lives, both business-wise and also with some personal insights. Mm. So that was what I was doing. I was putting all these documents together and figuring out what was there. 
Very exciting. So this is this is where you were spending your time working here, primarily at the there's the the old meeting house that's in Manset. And if anyone hasn't had a chance to visit when they open next season, I encourage they're um, using the sanctuary for exhibits and public programs. And then to the right there is what's called the Gleaners Hall, and and that's where the collections are. Is that correct? Yes, a nice a, a collection of shelves with lots of little bits and pieces on them. It's a very it's a very quaint collection. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. So, so you're getting into this collection and you start to realize that you have um, maybe a more complete picture of someone's life put together through these historic records. So when did you realize or how did you kind of come to realize that, that this was something really special that you wanted to pursue and, and learn more about? So it's really unusual to find, unless someone has written a diary their entire lives, and it takes a very particular person in history to write everything that goes on in their lives and keep all of those documents, it's unusual to find such a complete story. There are pieces missing, but you have something from every decade for both David King and William Heath. And as I was going through them and I sorted them into the, into an order, I'm like, hang on a second, there's actually... You could actually tell a story here. It's not just here's one thing that happened and we have evidence for it. It was all oh, these you have these guys entire lives and their families. And also because all the other people in their community don't have that remaining and there isn't necessarily evidence of those people. David King and William Heath become almost representative of the lives that people in that century lived. Mm. So it was actually kind of a stroke of luck that Chewbacca were working on on the annual magazine at the same time that I happened to be in South West Harbour doing this. Um, and it was my partner who recommended, oh, you should reach out and see like see what their theme is this year. And the theme was very relevant. <laughs> so we had our little meeting and very kindly said, yeah, we'd love to give you the opportunity of writing an article about this discovery you'd made. So it's kind of yeah, a strange. That was yeah, I think so too. It was really fortuitous that you came to us when you did and that we had space in the edition, which can be unusual um, towards the fall. And um, and then just being able to highlight both new people from the history of MDI, but also having a new voice and a new scholar and in, in your ability to pull that story together as quickly as you did is commendable. Like that was pretty amazing. Oh, I had the time. <laughs> <laughs> so um you were working essentially with a collection of letters, bills of landing, other documents that told us about the lives of these two families. So what kinds of things, like who were Captains Heath and Captain King and what did they do? Where did they live? Tell us a little bit about them. Okay, so you've got Captain William Heath Jr. specifically, son of Captain William Heath. He also had a son who he called William Heath, um, <laughs> but it's the, the middle man, William Heath Jr. He was born in 1796 in Seal Cove, uh, Tremont, if I'm saying that correctly. Mm -hmm. um, and he lived there his whole life. He, um, he was the son of, so William Heath's father was captain and a revolutionary war veteran from New Hampshire. Um, he was one of, I think, six children, so they all had quite big families back then. Um, he married Catherine Mackenzie, who was native to Mount Desert Island as well, and they had eight children together over two decades, which is a considerable number. Okay. Um, so he was, he kind of took over his father's business. Um, he was working for his father originally and then went off on his own, and ran a he was captain of these ships he was the master of these ships he was running freights up and down the east coast of america um all, well, all the way up from canada and then at one point his one of his ships is also in jamaica so he really is covering a very broad stretch of space um he's dealing with things like uh plaster and wooden planks and um, is it like building materials and he's selling them for a lot of money he's doing very well for himself um, over the course of his life he's investing in various other ships they all part own lots of different businesses and they all make profit from them um, so he's doing he's doing very well for himself 
um, his whole life. David King was perhaps more humble in his business. He started off as a postmaster. Um, he was born in 1804, sorry. So little under a decade after William Heath. Um, we don't really know where he came from as much, but we know by his early 20s, he's living in Southwest Harbor and he's working as a postmaster and he's doing that for around a decade. And then he gets into the mariner trade and he's dealing in herring mostly. Um, he is going down to places like Boston. So he is still going quite far, but not as far as William Heath was. Um, he married Lucy originally and they had five children together. And then after Lucy sadly passed away, he married Emma and they had three children together. So again, very big household, lots going on in their lives. So we put up this picture of these um these examples of coasting schooners, obviously there are no photographs from when um, they were in shipping in the early parts of their lives, but we sort of thought that these were characteristic of the types of coasting schooners that are described in their, um, in their records. So my, I'm, I'm by no means a historian of seafaring or fully understand, um, the maritime trade myself I'm more of a people's historian so a lot of my background knowledge on this is actually drawn from um is it Ralph Stanley his um book on that he like catalogued all of the schooners and I could find through that um the ones that William Heath and David King were involved in oh that's and very that's, cool and that's where all of the like all of the measurements and the, how many tons they weighed were. It's like, oh, they actually have an accurate description of what ships they were working on. That is amazing. So um, this rather like dizzying and inter <laughs> very <laughs> document is the kinds of material you were working with. Just to give an mm -hmm. example to people to see what these letters and other documents will show a few others as we're here. Um, so they're telling us about their business records, but what other kinds of things are we learning about their families? I mean, you've dug in to find out about their marriages and their children, which were through sort of not their correspondence, but through additional research that you did when you started to dig in um, for the article. But what kinds of things were they talking about in their in their letters and what kinds of things we knew what they were shipping, but what other um, records were telling us about their lives? So there's very specific stories that pop up based on the the chance that these records have um survived you've got the letters from um um Lucy King's neighbor who moved away to Esther Nichols that's her name mm -hmm. um she moved away to Newburyport and you don't have any of Lucy King's letters but you have all of Esther Nichols um, generally you do end up with just one side of the conversation in those instances. And she's talking about the way that, um, you know, men who are working at sea were away for a long time. So it actually could be quite lonely for women at home and they had a lot to do at home they had to look after the children. They were very concerned with their health, very mm -hmm. concerned with the health of their families and their friends and the whole community um, she specifically quotes the um, concern around smallpox at the time. And she's also saying how, like, she misses that sense of community that they had in Mount Desert Island and in Southwest Harbour specifically. I think that's also what um, the, I can talk about it a bit later on as well, the Benevolent Society. We've got mm -hmm. the logbooks for them, of the women and their families getting involved together and doing things as a community. So you've got the letters are giving you personal insight of life at home. And then you've also got um, specific stories of usually things going wrong. Mm. And that's when things get written down. It's like this person said something and I'm going to take them up on it and they're going to go to court for it. <laughs> um, so there was the mishap with the anchor because one of um, William Heath Jr.'s ships ran aground and there was some sort of disaster. They lost lots of money. They lost lots of the ship as well, including the anchor. And somehow um, one of the men on Mount Desert Island claimed the anchor, 
um, but was claiming it almost like a bounty for it. But William Heath was came up to him and he was like, no, that's mine by right. You can't hide it from me. And then this guy saying, no, you can't have it unless the law takes it from me. And it's kind of hard to interpret exactly what happened because it was a statement made by somebody in this like, court case. But it goes to show how like they were very aware of like possessions and ownership of things and like when it came to running a business every penny did count mm. and they were very wary of how their business was being run especially if their business was being run away from them so when William Heath Jr gets older he's staying at home more often and he's hiring other people to run his ships and run the freights up and down the east coast um so there's there's a couple more within there, and I definitely encourage everybody to go to the Southwest Harbour Historical Society website and have a look at the documents as well and the transcriptions that we do have. And there's there's so many little tidbits about how they ran their business. And like I said, things going wrong and people getting into trouble for it. We have some great comments coming in um, from people who know this a little bit more about this story too. And a lot of these are related to business uh, um, and their backgrounds. So I'll share them now. Um, one is that William Heath Jr. was more well-to-do than most Seal Cove community members. And William Jr.'s father was a mill operator. William Jr. owned a, sh owned a shipyard with John Fly near his sawmill and some of his ships he built himself. And the laws of salvage from shipwrecks are very specific. The anchor was in question regarding the salvage, which is in your article, actually. Um, you mm -hmm. detail that pretty well, which is great. So thank you, um, Therese, for sharing that. And then we also have a, a comment that the, the first, William Heath, was a soldier who signed up at age 15 to serve in the New Hampshire res Regiment. I don't know if he was a captain. Oh, I'm not sure if he was a captain himself. I, I may have misquoted that. I know he was a Revolutionary War veteran. They have a um, they had a piece of um, one of the documents, or I think it was one that was found online. Was him claiming either land or compensation because of his um, because he was a Revolutionary War veteran. Mm -hmm. So that's where that idea comes from. Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, and then there's clarification that he was not a captain. So, all right. That was not the, the, then that part wasn't really the focal of your research for the older generations, right? No. Like were, yeah. I was specific. I mean, the documents in the box specifically yeah, exactly. <laughs> are just to do with William Heath Jr. and David King, and then a couple of their descendants as a few pieces for, but the main story is just the two, the two captains. So it's great. Like, that's what is so amazing about community history is like all these different threads that people know and familiar with that have researched their own part of something come together in these ways through these conversations to make a larger mm -hmm. whole. So I'm grateful for the sharing that we're getting throughout this conversation. Um, this is a piece that didn't make it into your article. Do you want to talk for a minute about um, this, this part of the records that you were looking at? So it's from um one of so it's essentially a log of the weather on top on the schooner orator um and it's going through just each day what the weather was like and it, what shocked me and probably doesn't shock um people who live on that desert island was how late into the year it was snowing um I was like why would it be snowing in April <laughs> uh, but it affected them you know if you're if you're on the waters and you've got high speed winds going and it's a blizzard essentially then you're not going to be able to go anywhere um so it was a nice insight it was again quite a humble thing that each day they were just they needed to know down what the weather was like and as it improved or as it got worse and whether or not they were going to set sail um, whether or not they were going to go ahead with it and it yeah it was it it was a it was a very um kind of human discovery amongst all of the receipts and bills about people buying things mm. as someone writing down oh this is what day-to-day -day life was like here's another example of the, what you're just talking about right the yeah, bills. lots of bills <laughs> 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 what were they buying um 
Yeah, mostly you get you can you can usually tell the difference between the the receipts for um supplies for the ship for the people on the ship because it will be there'll be a lot smaller quantity and mm. then the things that they were actually selling they'd have barrels and barrels of herring for example and it wasn't because they were eating one of it obviously yeah. <laughs> so what stories so there's a lot you've been able to tell and extrapolate and be able to do additional research to figure out like the the family ties and the extensiveness and, and their their marriages what kinds of stories are missing from the records that you found? So, I mean, one of the things this it kind it leads into why you can't just you do have to try and get as much background information as you can from other sources because from these documents alone, I didn't know when they were born. I didn't really. You could guess where they were living. You could guess a bit about family life but you couldn't quite tell you had to make inferences um it wasn't always clear or consistent where they were and it takes things like the census record to fill in those gaps and be like oh no they've actually moved at one point and um also connecting the dots between so something that so William Heath Jr was married to Catherine McKenzie and the master of the schooner orator at one point was Reuben McKenzie and only with extra documents on top of that can you piece together the family history and figure out how those two are actually related and then how perhaps you can speculate how William Heath then came to know Reuben or how he came to meet his wife perhaps um so it doesn't there's always details missing and also it's, even though it is a very complete story of their entire lives, it isn't every single build that was done and every single instance that happened. And you're never going to get every single detail of what's going on. So you do have to speculate occasionally or just accept that actually we don't know what happened in 1845 specifically because we don't have any evidence of it. So it is the use of the complementary evidence that's fleshing that out. When I, one of the things I found really interesting when we were working with your article was even though the title and a lot of the, the documents that you have are related to the two ship captains, you start by talking about the, the women in their lives and how absent they often are from historic documents like the types you were finding other than some of the correspondence. Mm -hmm. So can you kind of talk a little bit about what that's like as a historian and um, and how you might kind of conduct additional research to build out a little more about what the lives of women or children might have been like at the same time? So it's, yeah, it's, it's forever going to be the challenge for someone who wants to go into being a women's historian specifically. Um, it's, it's a lot of piecing together from records pertaining to men um, and trying to figure out or trying to empathise through not just documents, but also things like material culture and the objects that they're using within particular environments to try and understand what their lives were like when everything that's written down is to do with their husbands or even their sons or their fathers. And something that always strikes me is how quite a lot of these women were illiterate. Mm. So when they were signing onto documents, they would put a cross rather than their signature and someone else would write the signature for them. And it, it does pose a challenge that they didn't, you know, it's when you find things like, um, like Esther Nichols' letters, it's it's a gem. It's mm -hmm. a you found something that's wonderfully preserved, and you have direct insight into what their lives are like, and what they're thinking and feeling, and what they're discussing with people with the people that they're close to. Mm -hmm. When you don't get that, you do have to, to a certain extent, use guesswork and interpretation, and 
understanding from a wider perspective that you know people have done research on particular trades and you find other niche stories about particular women that you do have documents about and you can kind of piece together what other people may have been experiencing similarly to them in similar environments but it it is a challenge when they haven't written down as much as their male counterparts Mm -hmm. and you mentioned earlier some of the like the societies that women might have been involved with that that are also like sort of um, tidbits or little bits of pieces of of the lives that they were putting together and their leadership in the community or their activities mm-hmm. and their relationships with each other. Yeah, so the the logbook for the Benevolent Society is there's a lot of entries and they all list who was there and they say that they did their, I believe it was the daily prayer. And then unless they were sewing something specific or there was a specific event, they then signed off. I was like, these people were here. But on the odd occasions when there was a big event, it also goes to show well, each of the meetings was hosted by someone different. And quite often it was the women who were hosting it. So you can imagine them going around to each house in turn and at the end of each meeting saying, OK, who's going to host the next one? OK, we'll see you in we'll see you next week or we'll see you in two weeks. And then occasionally there's a case of, oh, we had to postpone this meeting because quite a few people were on well. So we're going to do it next time. But it goes to show that they were really involved in a tight-knit community with each other and also goes to show how important religion was to them as well as a community. It was based on Christian beliefs of um, charity and supporting those in need. Um, They they did a lot of, especially in the winter, of they would sew a particular, like, extra, sewing is the wrong word, they would, like, weave quilts specifically for people in need of them. Mm. so they, yeah, they were very, they were still very busy. <laughs> they were doing a lot. Um, we've had additional input. And um, so I would just say these these half an hours go really fast. I would encourage anyone for any questions or comments as we sort of start to think about um, winding down our chat. We did have um, something about uh, William Jr. ended up being bankrupt. Um, so I don't know if that was in your records or not. I was under the impression he had quite a lot of money at the end of his, um, on his uh, probate records, he had something like $8,000 in estate and $2,000 in, I don't know what cash. Um, I I may be wrong in assuming that that is a lot of money Mm -hmm. considering the money that he had throughout his life perhaps in comparison that was not a lot to be left with but in comparison to David King it was four times as much as David King ended his life with oh wow um and then newspaper articles have stories about Catherine McKenzie so just good to know Mm -hmm. Um, and the Tremont Historical Society has the discharge papers signed by George Washington for the first William Heath I will verify if he was a captain or a soldier. So awesome. Marty, thank you. And um, we'll be able to get that information at some point and um, keep keep the conversation going and updated. Um, any other questions or comments as we, um, my, my last question for you as we see if additional things come through from the um, audience would be um, to just talk a little bit at, like this, this was such a, um, kind of unexpected and unplanned find. Like so many times when we're working with archives, we know the collections that we want somebody to work with or we understand. And and so I just would love you to talk a little bit about the importance of archives to you personally and to the work that you are doing and that you foresee yourself doing as your career unfolds before you. and how you think those archives are are important or vital to our communities and our ability to understand history today? Uh, personally, I, I mean, I couldn't do what I do without archives existing. It's the the excitement of discovering something and then following a lead and almost feeling like a historical detective. Um, I think archives, there's so much still to find. I know that in the future, I'm going to be finding more stories about more people and wanting to share them with everyone. (laughs) Um, 
and like with each new um with each new project that pops up it's a case of oh I wonder what the documents say about this <laughs> it's like oh I wonder what actually we could find out through the documents so they're always going to be very not just very useful they're a pinnacle to our understanding of what's going on in the past so thankfully lots of people wrote down everything that was happening and then because of archives and the efforts of both volunteers and workers within archives they've been preserved and they still exist today for people like me to go and rifle through (laughs) and um, piece together stories out of them um I think when it comes to the community it's it's it feels really it's really nice when you have a connection to your own past especially when you feel grounded in the community in the modern community the case of where did you come from um and a general sense of identity within communities both small and large those archives and that history is going to play a really vital role um in our identity as people both individually and connecting with others as well i think every single historical society i've been to so far we've connected over the fact that oh look we both have past that we can trace in these areas and we can share stories about our ancestors who lived in these areas um so it really brings people together i love that i love that um, we don't have any additional questions or comments, but I love that we've had sort of a robust exchange um, throughout the, the conversation, which is fantastic. Um, so, and it's like 10 o'clock your time. <laughs> so I will just yes. um, wrap up with, you know, here we, you, you went out and actually went out onto the landscape and had a chance mm-hmm. to um, just connect in a, like a personal way. You have, do you have any story you want to share with? With us about that experience. So I think I'd spent about two weeks at this point reading through these documents and almost feeling like I was getting to know these people. They were real people. They did live long lives and they did a lot within them. And as I was getting to know them, I thought, oh, I wonder if we can find where they're buried. And we went um did a search on Find My Grave, which is a very useful website. It's extensive catalogue of Mostly people were just saying, oh, here, I found this person and they'll upload it. And we found the King Cemetery, conveniently named, at the end of King's Lane, also conveniently named. <laughs> um, and it was a, it was a mildly windy day. And we went um, we went to this little, it's literally a very small square copse of trees. And you had... David King's headstone, Lucy King and Emma King, and then their children, and then the, a few generations of their descendants behind them. And as I walked up to David King's gravestone, the tree behind me cracked really loudly. <laughs> and I just jumped out of my skin. <laughs> it just And it just made the whole experience feel kind of spooky, but also perhaps goes to show maybe I'm slightly suspicious superstitious <laughs> but it really made me think oh they're here mm. like this is what remains of them and if we didn't have these documents this is all that would really remain of them other than us being able to pass down stories by word if we didn't have the written if we didn't have the written evidence we wouldn't know what David King's life was like we wouldn't know who Lucy was or who Emma was or who their children were and the experiences that they had so it was a very, very humbling experience. Yeah. Um, we do have a comment from Marty Lyons who says, Jesse, please connect with the Tremont Historical Society if you return to the island. Thanks for researching the two historical men that left their mark about Tremont history. So that's nice. I will hopefully be returning. Don't worry. <laughs> Great. So um, thank you so much for your research and your time. I know it's really late for you in, um, on the other side of the Atlantic there. Um, oh, wait. So would you be willing to say something briefly about the Heath Cemetery? Yes, I can. Um, so we found the Heath Cemetery through, I believe there was a, I can't remember the name of it. There's a book of all of the graveyards on Mount Desert Island. Um and we found the location for it and through Google Maps, I kind of found it. And we we traipsed through 
some woodlands we knocked on someone's door who very politely let us it was like oh I think it might be that way I was like okay thanks um <laughs> and we it was essentially what used to be a, a, a woodland but all the trees had been felled and despite clambering over quite a few trees and trying to figure out where the site of the cemetery was I think we found where it used to be um there were some kind of suspicious looking hills that looked like they might be walls and that's again the archaeologist talking um but we do know it's in that area because in 2015 on find my grave there's a photograph of it so the trees are all standing and the graveyard has a wall around it and there's a few standing headstones and quite a few flattened ones. So it definitely is there. But when I was there last year, it was buried. So mm. whether or not the situation has changed in the last year, I don't know. Um, however, I do know from the book that Captain William Heath Jr. was not in that cemetery. Mm. So it was the Heath Cemetery, but the the man in question wasn't there himself. Does it say where he is? No. <laughs> I couldn't figure out where he's been buried. So if anyone does figure it out, please let me know. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you so much again. I'm so grateful for your time and, and just the, the time that you invested in our island, only being here four weeks. And um in, in spending that time at the Southwest Harbor Historical Society and digging through this material and writing this article is a real gift to the island and to our community. And I'm I'm super grateful for it. And so we're getting some nice thank yous and some great chat comments coming up from people. Um, so yeah, Chewbacca Chats um, airs every week on Thursdays from 4.30 to 5. And our next one is actually, next week is obviously Thanksgiving. So we're skipping next week. So the next one will be on November 30th which is with Joan Grant on a self-published book that she wrote called Lydia Stories, The Carroll Family History from 1761 to 1917. So hopefully we'll, people will be able to join us for that. Um, Chewbacca chats are available to view on our website the week after they air. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel at MDI History to be notified when we've uploaded them. You can become a member or renew your membership by visiting our website as well. So thank you all very much. And again, thank you, Jesse. I really appreciate it. And um, we will see you when we um, when we resume Chewbacca Chats on November 30th. Thanks, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>